Almighty God, the gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Alleluia. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. This is also the sermon text. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Allow me please to say up front that I very well may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I may not be the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. Perhaps I am not pulling a full load. I'm really trying on keeping my ego under control. Remember that ego, that pride, that self-absorption we talked about last week? But even so, I am still amazed with the number of people I encounter who, to put it very succinctly, simply are out of touch with reality. Here's a remarkable illustration of this. Uh, Jay Kessler wrote the following in his book, Raising Responsible Kids. Shortly after I got my driver's license, I was driving too close to the middle of the narrow road and I sideswiped another car. The crash tore the front fender, two doors, and the rear fender from my dad's car. After I found out everyone was okay, I stood in the ditch and prayed, Dear God, I pray this didn't happen. <laughs> it's just out of reality here, okay? Um, I opened my eyes and saw that the car was still wrecked. So I closed my eyes, squinted really hard, and prayed again, Dear God, it didn't happen. Then I opened my eyes. It happened anyway. Now sometimes you and I are J. We act just like this person in the illustration. We have lost our grasp of reality. Now I don't need a show of hands because this is purely rhetorical. But how many of us are guilty of doing the same activity over and over and over again, all the while expecting a different result? Some say it was Albert Einstein who claimed insanity is doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. Others claim the saying originated with Benjamin Franklin or Mark Twain. Uh, it really doesn't matter who first championed this phrase. The truth it pro professes is true. Sometimes we are out of touch with reality. We simply act as if we are insane. The gospel tells us a story this morning of a group of people who are out of touch with reality. 
Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Interesting interchange going on here. Jesus says, the truth will make you free. And the Jews replied, we've never been slaves to anyone. You and I all make mistakes or errors when we speak. We have those slip of the tongue moments. Um, the correct usage of the verbs lie and lay baffles us. Uh, we confuse the noun effect, which starts with the letter E, with the verb affect, which starts with the A. And for some of us, the choice between there, T-H-E-R-E, and there, T-H-E-I-R, and there, T-H-E-Y, apostrophe R-E, is fraught with danger. And for those of us who must speak in front of large audiences, we all know that we often make mistakes when it comes to simple math. For the Jews who are listening to Jesus, this, we have never been slaves to anyone, was not a slip of the tongue. This was not an error or a mistake. This was an audacious, outlandish falsehood. We know Israel's history, so did they. There was this 400 year slavery in Egypt. And even after Israel's establishment as a nation, the surrounding nations often subjected Israel. Well, then the Assyrians conquered the kingdom of Israel and the Babylonians destroyed the kingdom of Judah. And then the Persians and the Medes arrive on the scene and then the Greeks and then the Romans. So what is this nonsense spoken by the Jews that say, we have never been slaves to anyone? We've never been slaves to anyone, the Jews said to Jesus. How can you say we shall be free? Now, rather than argue with the Israelites over their ignorance of their history, and rather than debate with them their motives for their erroneous statements, Jesus simply moves on and he says, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Allow me, please, to describe in just a small portion this freedom Jesus offers us by using an illustration that focuses on slavery and on freedom, about being enslaved to the opinions of others and finding freedom in what God thinks of us. I think one of the most persistent and familiar yokes of slavery that you and I experience is our being enslaved to what others think of us, what others expect of us. We live life trying to gain people's approval. And we are so tortured when someone ignores us or doesn't say hello to us or perhaps smile at us. And you, you've heard that little voice in the back of your head, what did I do? And we're disturbed and we're crushed by a word of censure or criticism and it ruins our day. And we become what one psychologist called approvaholics. We want everyone to approve of us all the time. Is that even possible? There's a story about a wife who had a husband that she felt she could never ever please. 
She made up her mind that she was going to do something that would finally draw that word of approval from his lips. So the next morning she got up and she asked him, Dear, what would you like for breakfast? His response was simple. Two eggs, one fried, one scrambled, toast and coffee. So she hurried to the kitchen and she worked hard at making this a most memorable breakfast for her husband. Uh, she set the table with special care. She went out into the garden and plucked some fresh flowers for the table. When she finished, uh, she called him into the kitchen for breakfast. He shuffled through. He sat down. She stood behind him with anticipation, waiting for that, for that compliment, that word of approval. Finally, he said, you did it again. He went and scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but even Jesus couldn't please everyone. We have to realize there are some people that we are never, ever going to please, no matter how hard we try. We also have to realize and remember that it's not what others say or think about us that determines who we are, but it is rather what God has said about you and me. This is a paraphrase. You are someone special. You are one and only. You are the one I found. I love you. I redeemed you. You are mine. And that paraphrase comes from a Bible translation that is most meaningful to me personally. This is from Isaiah 43. You've heard me say it before. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. It boggles my mind to think what God has done for me. God has created me, God has redeemed me, God has called me by my very name. God says, I am part of the heavenly family. And then in the gospel, Jesus, God's son, now tells me, in addition to all this, I am free. Now, I shared with us the following illustration last Easter Sunday. In a most poignant way, this story illustrates what freedom, what true freedom is all about. One day, Abraham Lincoln went to a slave auction and he noticed a young woman glaring at everyone with hate and contempt. She had no doubt been used and abused all her life. Being on the auction block was now one more humiliation. Lincoln was moved. So when the bidding started, he offered a large sum and he kept on bidding until he won. And after he paid the auctioneer and he had received title to this slave, <coughs> the young woman followed him, of course looking at him with utter contempt. The young slave asked Lincoln what he was going to do with her. He said, I'm going to set you free. Free? Free for what? She asked. Just free. Completely free. Free to do whatever I want to do? Yes. Free to go are free to say what I want to say and go where I want to go? Yes. 
And Lincoln continued to, to answer this flood of questions that flowed out of her unbelief. Then she finally said, I want to go with you. You see, you and I are set free from sin because of Jesus' holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. God did not give us that freedom, though, to live, a, to live as we please or to live as we see fit or to live according to our human desires or to go back to the pigsty of sin. Rather, we are set free from sin so that we can be free for service. Free from sin, free for service. Now, as, as Jim mentioned to you at the beginning of the service, the, worship, or the stewardship committee is placed in your church mailboxes, the time and talent survey for the upcoming year. And as you look through those, that long list of opportunities that present themselves for your consideration, uh, please hear the words of Jesus as he is speaking to you. In Mark chapter 12, when asked which commandment was the greatest, our Lord proclaimed, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Set free from sin, now you and I are set free to serve. Lovingly to serve God, lovingly to serve our neighbor. Sometimes, though, we start to slip back into our slavery to sin. And, and you all know how that feels. Because when that happens, then our love and service to God and neighbor is done only out of a sense of obligation or a fear of punishment if we do not or because we are convinced that someone has strong-armed us or, or because we feel manipulated or because we experience guilt. Listen to this final story as to why we lovingly serve. A little girl at the time of the Reformation thought of God as being more of a heavenly vulture sitting in heaven watching and waiting to see what we do wrong. And then God would pounce on us. Her father worked in the print shop where they were printing Luther's new translation of the Bible. One day, the little girl found a scrap of paper that her father had dropped. After she read it, there was a noticeable change in her attitude. Uh, she was kind to everyone, she was courteous, she was helpful to her mother. And one day her mother asked her why she was so different. So she showed her mother this little piece of paper that she kept in her apron, and that slip read this, God so loved the world that he gave. And that's all it said. And the mother said, how could that change your life? The little girl replied, if God loves me so much that he wants to give me something, I don't have to be afraid of him. And I want to be giving as God is giving. Her image of God had changed. God was more like this loving mother hen than that hunting vulture. I want to be giving as God is giving. What a fantastic thought. So we return back to that time and talent survey that the stewardship committee has distributed. We remember Jim's words of encouragement this morning regarding our financial offerings. I specifically remember Jim's talk last year where Jim and you did a wonderful job of talking about how we are to give generously and we are to give proportionally and we are to do it regularly and we are to do all of this together. My prayer is that as we approach the upcoming year, we see our stewardship not as a sense of obligation, 
but as a sense of opportunity, not out of fear, but out of faith, not feeling strong-armed, but because of our own personal desire, not out of guilt, now out of gratitude, as a, little, as a little girl so profoundly proclaimed, I want to be giving as God is giving. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.